Hi everyone, my name is Diana Collins and I'm the chair of the Law Related Education Committee of the Pennsylvania Bar Association and I'm adjunct faculty at the University of Scranton. Thank you so much for tuning in today to learn more about your right to vote. I remember my first election fondly. I cast my first vote in the year 2000 during the Bush versus Gore presidential election and my mom was there with her disposable camera to take my picture. It was a memorable election for many reasons, and I'm very happy that I cast my vote. Whether this is your first election or you just want to learn more about your right to vote, we're so happy that you're joining us today. We can see just how invested your generation is in the issues that affect our country. You've been vocal and active and committed to making our lives and our communities better. We recognize that many of you might feel exhausted and drained right now, but we're here to remind you that now's not the time to slow down or tune out. Now's the time to take your energy to the next level and make sure that your passion and your activism yield real results. We want you to feel proud and feel confident in our democracy and our electoral system. And we wanna give you all the information you need to make sure that your voice is heard so that you have your say in this election. The only way that you can do that is to make a plan to cast your vote and we're here to tell you how. So I'd like to introduce our moderator, my friend and colleague, the Chief Staff Attorney of the Superior Court of Pennsylvania, Philip Yoon. Thank you, Diana. It's truly an honor to be involved in this important webinar. And hello, everyone out there. Welcome to your, vo your vote is your voice. Make sure you're heard. To help guide you through the voting process, we have an esteemed panel, along with peers of yours who will be asking important press questions about the process. But first, allow me to introduce a man who is instrumental not only in making this webinar possible, but is also very invested in ensuring, in ensuring everyone in Pennsylvania has an opportunity to exercise their right to vote. Please welcome the president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, attorney David Schwager of Luzerne County. Mr. President. Hello everyone. Thank you, Phil, for that kind introduction. Thank you to you, Diana, and the planning committee for your outstanding work on this webinar. And thank you to the panelists for taking time out of your hectic schedules to be here today. As the 126th president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, I'm excited to be a part of this very important program on voting. The PBA has been around for 125 years, since 1895, for those of you who are history buffs. That means Grover Cleveland was the president of our country back then. And in case you ever encounter this trivia question, he was the only president ever to serve two non-consecutive terms. He was the 22nd and the 24th president separated by our 23rd president, the esteemed Benjamin Harrison. You may wonder why an association of lawyers is stepping up to encourage people to vote and working to make sure citizens have the information they need to cast their ballot. Instead, I say, who better than lawyers? As lawyers, we are sworn to protect and defend the United States and Pennsylvania constitutions. Our profession has a long history of protecting important rights and advocating for people who have been wronged. We strive to create a society where laws are in place to keep us safe and conflicts are resolved by following due process. In other words, we live by the rule of law. But we as lawyers are only one part of the story. Each of you is an equally important contributor to our American democracy. Each of you has an opportunity to research the candidates who want to be the decision makers on issues that set the course for our future. The decisions that we make now are charting the course for what comes next. Getting back to the subject of history that I started with, when we look back at how our history has unfolded, we sometimes forget the power that we the people have to influence what will be written in the history books about the time in which we live. What will history say about 2020, other than how rotten a year it was? Where do you stand on important issues that will determine what your future and your children's future looks like? We aren't here to promote any candidate, but rather to challenge you to take action. Think about which candidate will represent your point of view on the economy, on dealing with the pandemic, who will give you the ability to access and afford health care, and many other critical issues that will impact your lives, both in the short term and in the future. 
we are a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. Your vote is your voice. Make sure you are heard. Register and vote. And to help us all do that safely, and as prescribed by law, I have the distinct honor of introducing our next speaker, Pennsylvania's Secretary of the Commonwealth, Kathy Bookbar. We are so appreciative that she made time to share this message about the voting process in Pennsylvania at a time when her office is incredibly busy preparing for November 3rd. It shows how invested she is in helping all of us understand how to vote and make sure our voice is heard. Secretary Bookbar. Hello, it's a pleasure to speak with you today about the vital importance of voting. And thank you to the Pennsylvania Bar Association's Law Related Education Committee for sponsoring this program. It couldn't be more timely as the November 3rd presidential election is quickly approaching in a little over a month. Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, is expected to play a key role in this election. So I really encourage every eligible Pennsylvanian to make sure to exercise your precious right to vote. Some of you may be first time voters and some of you may not yet be eligible to vote, but I hope that you're already thinking about registering to vote as soon as you're eligible. I remember that I couldn't wait to vote. I didn't turn 18 until I was already in college, but once I started voting, I got hooked. But if you had told me that 33 years later, I would be Secretary of State overseeing elections in one of the largest swing states in the country, I would have told you you were out of your mind. However, as Pennsylvania Secretary of State and Chief Election Official, as well as a former voting rights attorney, I can tell you that I know we can never take our right to vote for granted, nor should any one of us. Some Americans had to fight against terrible odds, endure great sacrifices, and wait far too long in order to be able to exercise the most fundamental right in a democracy. We just celebrated on August 26th, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. Women, half of our citizenry, had to wait 144 years after the birth of our country to vote. African Americans had to wait even longer, fighting until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which finally gave unfettered access to the voting booth. And it wasn't until 1971, less than 50 years ago, that young Americans ages 18 to 20 obtained the right to vote. Up until that time, you had to be 21 years old to cast a ballot. Yet many Americans somehow persist in the belief that one vote, their vote, won't matter. They forget that the 2000 presidential election was decided by a mere 537 votes in Florida. That's about the size of a, of a student body in the average American high school. Never take your right to vote for granted or assume it won't make a difference. In order to encourage young people to get involved and register to vote, this administration, Governor Wolf's administration, created the Governor's Civic Engagement Award for Pennsylvania high schools about three years ago. Schools that register to vote at least 65% of their eligible students, as well as students who work as poll workers, can win recognition and awards. Even if your school isn't already participating in the program, I urge you to consider planning a voter registration event at your school or to volunteering to serve as a poll worker. You can find more information at votespa.com. Not only is exercising your right to vote key for the con con continuation and advancement of our democracy, but it's also more convenient and secure than ever before in Pennsylvania. Now you have three options about how to vote in Pennsylvania. Recently, Pennsylvania introduced mail-in voting that every Pennsylvanian can vote by mail for any reason or no reason at all. You can apply now online for a ballot at votespa.com, receive it in the mail within the next couple of weeks, fill it out curled up in bed with your dog, and return it weeks before election day. Go to votespa.com. Don't wait. Do it today. Beginning in the next week or so, you can also vote early in person but on paper ballot at your county election offices. Call ahead, you can go to votespa.com. We have all the contact information about your county election office. 
call ahead, find out what their hours are, and then you could go in person at any time. That's how I'm going to vote this year. I'm going to next week call my county election office, go in person, apply for my ballot, fill it out while I'm there, and cast it all in one visit on my own schedule. And of course, you could vote the traditional way. You can go to the polls on Election Day on November 3rd, vote anytime between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. And all 67 counties are now using new secure voting systems with voter verifiable paper ballots. Whichever way you vote, all three methods of voting are safe, secure, and accessible, and ensure that your vote will be counted. In the last two years, we have strengthened security and integrity even more, while at the same time increasing access to the vote. If you vote by mail or early in person, our strong processes require your application to be checked and your eligibility to be confirmed by the county election office, and no voter is mailed a ballot unless they are determined first to be eligible. Counties do an excellent job and take this responsibility very seriously. If you vote in person on election day, that will also be safe and secure. As I mentioned, we required all counties to upgrade their voting systems to new voter verifiable paper ballot voting systems, meeting the highest standards of accessibility and security. And we are providing all polling places with masks, gloves, face shields, uh, sneeze guards, tape to mark social distancing, disinfectant spray, hand sanitizer, and more. It will be a safe, secure situation. Wear a mask, wash your hands before and afterwards, and of course, maintain social distance. And of course, all three of these options require that you first register to vote. The deadline to register for this year is October 19th, and you can do that online at votespa.com. It's very easy. So this fall, I urge you to do three things, in addition to studying hard, of course. If you're old enough and meet the other eligibility requirements, register to vote and cast your ballot in the November 3rd election, either by mail, early in person, or on election day at the polls. Our democracy works best when everyone participates. Two, consider serving as a poll worker. My first job in elections was as a poll worker, and I can tell you, you never feel more like you're part of that wheel of democracy as you do when you are literally helping every American exercise their right to vote. Three, think about what you see on social media before you retweet or repost. Unfortunately, in every election cycle, dishonest sources deliberately spread false information to try to suppress the vote. Do not let them achieve that goal. There is all kinds of misinformation and untrue claims about mail-in voting, about polling place hours, any number of other things that are deliberately put out there, known to be false, to confuse and shake people's confidence. Help us fight that. Rely only on trusted, informa trusted information and trusted sources, such as our red website, votespa.com. You can also call 877-VOTES-PA if you have questions about anything you see. And you can also call your county election office. You can find everything you need from voter registration to requesting a mail-in ballot to information about your voting systems, deadlines, the location of your polling place, and much more information at votespa.com. American democracy has endured and thrived for 244 years because each generation has stepped up to meet its civic responsibilities, including voting in elections, serving as poll workers, running for office, and defending and protecting voting rights. When you turn 18, please join us to continue that long tradition and begin participating in the civic life of our nation. The future of our democracy depends on it and depends on you. Thank you and see you at the polls. But I do want to offer our, sin our sincere and profound thanks to Madam Secretary Bookfar. Um, I think hopefully from that clip, you can see how passionate she is about making sure you know everything about your ability to vote. But let's, uh, let's get to the heart of the matter. You, you want to know the how, the why, and even the who of voting. And I'm very pleased to introduce two students at the University of Scranton who will be voting next month and who have important questions for our panelists. We have first Ms. Victoria Mastrofilippo, who is also president of the Pre-Law Society at the University of Scranton and Mr. Curtis Wiltshire. Victoria, let's start with you. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. 
I've voted before, but this is my first presidential election. And I do have a couple of questions. I've been reading about the history of the right to vote, but not everyone can vote. I'm really interested in learning more about who can vote today. Thank you, Victoria. And we'll be sure the panelists address this. Hello, Curtis, how are you? What can our panelists address for you today? Hi, I'm happy to be here too. And I've been learning a lot about our history and our right to vote. And I do have a couple of questions as well. Plus, I'm not sure where and how we can vote during the pandemic. Where and how can we vote today? Thanks, Curtis. I know our panelists will be excited to answer your questions. Before we turn to our panel, you may notice that throughout, some of us have or will be offering memories of our first time voting. I actually wanted to share a different experience with you. My mom's first time voting. You see, my mom became a naturalized citizen after I turned 18. So yes, I voted before my mom did. My mom wasn't able to get her US citizenship until after my brother and I became adults. She, uh, actually we, were so proud when she became a citizen. And you should have seen her excitement when she got to vote for the first time. I will never forget her pride that year. And I hope all of you will also experience that exhilaration. Of course, women like my mom haven't always had such an easy time or weren't even always legally allowed to vote. Which leads me to our first panelist, Dr. Susan Paulson. Dr. Paulson is a professor of history at the University of Scranton. Her specialty is modern American history and American women, which is especially pertinent because America just commemorated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed women the right to vote. Dr. Paulson, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Phil, and thank you everyone who organized this and the Pennsylvania Bar Association. I'm so happy to be a part of it. Um, what I'd like to do today is briefly sketch uh, some of the obstacles that many Americans faced in getting the right to vote. The truth is that uh, most of us who are going to vote in this election in uh, 200 years ago would not have had the right to vote, and I'd like to sketch out how some of these um, movements came about. Well, when we start this nation, actually, uh, the people who could vote were white men, but not all white men. There, most states had requirements that they had to own property, and this uh, disbards many voters. Uh, North Carolina is the last state to require to end property qualifications, and they did so in 1856. And then, of course, at the end of the Civil War, uh, black men were given the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, um, but that ended up being mostly on paper. There were a few years after the Civil War where um, black men voted and were politicians and senators and congressmen, but there was the rise of uh, white supremacy in this, mostly in the South that rose up in the late 1800s that began to prevent men, uh, black men from voting. And these would be the t uh, tactics of poll tax, literacy tests, grandfather clauses. And then those are legal tactics. Then there were illegal tactics of uh, the Ku Klux Klan and other groups that used violence to intimidate black men out of voting. And so Mississippi, for example, which had a majority of black citizens, had no politicians that were black at the middle and upper echelons. Now what corrects this is a long coming civil rights movement that uh, you could say begins in the 1940s but really gathers momentum in the 50s and 60s. And what we'll focus on today is the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which finally guaranteed the right to vote and uh, put the federal government behind some enforcement mechanisms to make sure there was compliance. And as a result, you know, Mississippi and other southern states begin to have um, black representation among politicians, for example. Now for women, they couldn't vote until 1920, and that's the passage of the 19th Amendment. We're celebrating its centennial this year. Um, they first called for the right to vote in 1848, but even then that was considered a, a very radical thing because most people believed women were incapable of, of competent political citizenship. Scientists, including Charles Darwin, asserted that women were intellectually and biologically inferior to men. Religion taught women, as it was interpreted then, to be 
uh, subordinate to male authority. Legally, the legal system we followed uh, melded a woman's legal status into her husband as soon as she married and 90% of women married back then. She couldn't sign contracts. She lost rights to her wages, her inheritance. She could not uh, uh, have legal control of her children. And then also socially, it just was believed that it would be too divisive if women voted. If they differed from their husband, that would divide family and divide society. But after 72 years of effort, that includes referendums, Colorado is the first state where men went to the polls and granted women the right to vote. That's in 1893, that's 45 years after the first call for the women to get the right to vote. Then in the 20th century, you have a younger generation that's more militant, and they begin to protest at the White House. They hold disruptive speeches, parades. They go to prison for the right to vote, and Congress finally passes the 19th Amendment in 1919, and it's ratified by the state of Tennessee shortly before the elections of 1920. So women get the right to vote, but of course, not all women because white supremacy is prevalent in many parts of the United States. And so black women also are um, prevented from voting until many of them until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There are other groups that are um, the face obstacles in voting Asian Americans, uh, immigrants of Asian descent in the early 1800s and early 1900s were barred from becoming citizens. This begins to change in the 1940s and in 19, after 1952, all Americans of Asian American ancestry can vote. For Native Americans, they were long barred from voting because they were not considered citizenship. And this again is granted piecemeal in the 20th century. And then finally, in 1971, I should add that the 26th Amendment to the United States lowered the voting age to the age of 18. And so uh, many young people, especially those baby boomers, began to vote. So most uh, Americans were originally barred from voting by race, sex, ethnicity. Um, these, there were social norms that often supported this, supported this subordination. All of them faced struggles trying to get the right to vote. It involved hundreds of thousands of people, decades of struggle, sometimes deadly. So think of the vote as hard won, as a victory for democracy, and that we're able to elect policymakers who are more responsive to the needs of all Americans so long as we vote. It's an ongoing struggle. And I hope we can recognize that we stand on the shoulders of those who fought these struggles. And that to vote is a recognition of our seat at the table and our engagement in the political struggles of today. And I think of this as especially important for young people who um, statistically are less likely to vote than middle-aged and older people. And that younger people bring, help bring in new norms to American society that are often progressive. And so, I applaud and encourage those who will vote in this next election. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paulson. Uh, you heard Victoria ask about, um, I'm sorry, my video was off. <laughs> you, you, asked, uh, you heard Victoria ask about uh, about women's right to vote. Does it surprise you that young people are still asking who can vote? No, it doesn't. Um, I think uh, it's been a long struggle to get the right to vote. We, these struggles are often buried in history. And you know, for young people, the 1960s and 1970s is a long time ago. We often tend to be an ahistorical people, which can be an advantage or a disadvantage. But hopefully by giving this brief little sketch of all these struggles and many more that are in American history, it gives us a sense of how precious and hard won this right to vote is. Thank you, Dr. Paulson. That's incredibly important and interesting information and we certainly appreciate your insight and expertise. I would like to now introduce our next panelist, Dr. Jesse Allen, who is a professor of law at University of Pittsburgh School of Law. 
Professor Allen has extensive experience in civil rights litigation. Dr. Allen, you heard Curtis's excitement about his first time voting opportunity. However, it's not as easy as just showing up at the polls or picking up a ballot at the local convenience store, is it? In fact, many students have expressed concerns like Curtis about how the pandemic may affect their voting rights. Can you give your thoughts along with tips and best practices for this voting cycle? Uh, sure. Uh, hang on a second though, because my screen is doing something weird. Ah, there we go. Um, but Phil, tell me something. I could talk right now about practicalities of voting, but isn't somebody else about to talk about that? Yes, yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, yeah. that would be fine. But what I prepared was something about voting rights. Yes, we'd love to hear about that. Okay, doke. Uh, specifically, I was asked a question before about, and this will um, cross over into practicalities about voting as well. Um, I was asked before to talk a little about how the pandemic might affect people's voting rights and affect the ways that people are voting. So, so that's what I wanted to talk about for a few minutes. Um, well, obviously there are many possible ways that it can and will affect uh, our, voting, uh, our voting methods and rights this year because the pandemic is dynamic, it's changing, and so are people's and government's responses to it. But I wanted to talk about one big issue and a big problem that I think is really important and that will ultimately be up to all of us to resolve that won't finally be resolved um, by government actors. So one way that state legislatures, courts, and election officials like Kathy Bukfar, who you saw in the video, who's uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth, are, are responding to the pandemic is by making remote ways of voting, mail-in voting, absentee voting, more available, more widely available. Um, and the idea is, of course, that people may not be safe or feel safe voting in person because they're afraid of contracting the virus. And it may be harder to staff in-person polling places because sitting in one room uh, for nine or 10 or 14 hours uh, to run a polling place could be a significant health risk. Although uh, many uh, election districts are saying that they're going to be able to staff all of their in-person polling places. In any case, all across the country, states have, have been issuing new rules and legislation to expand the opportunity to vote by mail. Now, the problem that I want to talk about is that some politicians and organizations are falsely claiming that voting by mail is subject to enormous corruption by fraud. Uh, and that as a result, an election that has been held significantly by mail will not be legitimate. Now, this is a nonpartisan uh, discussion that we're having, uh, but I feel like it is absolutely um, critical to identify the fact that one side has in, been in particular asserting over and over that the mail-in voting process is likely to be corrupt and that they will not or may not accept the results of an election that has been conducted with significant participation by mail. And specifically, President Trump has said that. Now, you need to understand, we've been talking about voting here and the importance of voting being your voice. And that's right, as long as the results of a democratically held election are accepted. One way that democracies turn into authoritarian regimes is when an elected leader refuses to accept the results of a democratic election. So one way that we could all lose our voting rights would be if we allowed a candidate or a party to refuse to abide by the results of a democratic election process for some false reason. Now, of course, another way that democracies become authoritarian regimes is by running fraudulent elections. So if it were true 
that mail-in voting has a history of significant fraud and is widely vulnerable to that fraud. And if there were evidence that people now were attempting to corrupt that process by fraud, then that would be a serious point and one that we would need to take seriously. But here is the thing. There is no such evidence. Now, let me back up a little bit here and explain, because this is something that it's, voting is so complicated in the United States. And that's because we're a federalist system where there's a lot of discretion allowed to states. And the Constitution uh, puts the creation of the voting processes, even for a national election, like the one we're about to have, in the hands of state government. So in the United States, every state has different voting processes. And most states do continue to rely primarily on voting in person on election day, November 3rd, coming up, right? Um, but that's certainly not the only method of voting. And many states have expanded the time frame, so they have early voting for weeks. Some states are already voting and have been voting for weeks up before the election. And all states have some provisions for voting remotely by mail. Um, in fact, there are five states that conduct their elections entirely or primarily, with very little exception, by mail. Um, now, in some states, uh, you can only vote by mail if you have a particular reason. You're going to be away on business, or you have a disability, or you're ill, and you're unable to get to the polls in person. Uh, and Pennsylvania, until recently, was one of those states. But last year, actually before the pandemic, Pennsylvania enacted a new law that makes it possible for any registered voter to vote by mail for any reason at all. All you need to do is apply for a mail-in ballot, receive that ballot, and either mail it back or drop it off at your county election office or in a satellite office where there's a drop box. Now, here's the thing. There are lawsuits all over the country that are challenging these expanded mail-in provisions. I should say a number of states that had more limited absentee voting have expanded that specifically just this year for the pandemic. So there are lawsuits all over the country challenging that and claiming that the reason that that, that shouldn't be allowed is that mail-in balloting is subject to a lot of fraud. But so far, they haven't come up with any evidence of that. In fact, in federal court here in Pennsylvania last month, a judge asked the party who was challenging that uh, the mail-in process to come forward with uh, a explicit and, and plausible evidence of that fraud. And the party then filed a 500-page document, which all of those who reviewed say doesn't really produce any significant evidence at all. There are minor instances here and there, um, but really no evidence that the mail-in process is riddled with fraud. Um, more recently, you might have heard a story about nine mail-in ballots in Philadelphia, uh, which were found uh, to have been put in the trash. And the allegation was that the, uh, the election workers had deliberately trashed the ballots because they didn't want the candidate that those ballots were for um, to, to win. But an investigation has made it seem that it's far more likely, if not certain, that that was a mistake. <laughs> that, the, the mail, the, that the envelope containing this ballot looks exactly like, and this is a kind of unfortunate mistake that election uh, procedures make all the time, looks exactly like another envelope that comes repeatedly to those offices that doesn't contain a ballot, but contains some other piece of paper that they routinely trash. And some newly uh, uh, appointed uh, election workers had mistaken these ballots for that and thrown them out. In any case, there's certainly no proof that this was fraud. And if it were, it would be nine ballots in a city of millions, right? So 
you know, don't just take my word for it. Just yesterday, a federal judge in Montana ruling on another one of these challenges in that case to Montana's expanded mail-in voting uh, held that uh, mail-in balloting there, uh, that the allegations were based on no evidence and said, quote, the contention that the upcoming election nationally will fall prey to widespread, here's my cat who likes, very interested in voting rights. Um, the, the contention that the upcoming election nationally, excuse me, will fall prey to widespread voting fraud is a fiction. That's the judge's word. So I'm here to tell you that the claims that mail-in balloting is widely fraudulent, that that's what's fraudulent. The claims are fraudulent, not the voting process. So it's up to us. I mean, ultimately, you have to not let those allegations confuse and discourage you and keep you from going to the polls. You have to believe that the results will be legitimate unless proven otherwise. And you have to hold every candidate and party that's involved in those elections to their promise to go through with those elections and abide by the results. And, and incidentally, you know, you heard Dr. Paulson say that originally um, only property could vote in this country. And that's right. And, you know, fraud has all along been a rationale for limiting voting rights. One of the reasons, one of the explanations that was given back in England and early on here for why people, only people with property could vote was, well, if you don't have property, and by property they meant land, then you're gonna be susceptible to have your, your vote bought off or be swayed. You don't have skin in the game, right? Because you don't have this property. So people can fraudulently uh, influence your vote. Fraud has always been a claim for ways to, to reduce and, and remove people's voting rights, and you can't allow it to happen this year. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for all of that information. It really is so important for both first-time and experienced voters to process all of what you explained. And you give an important reminder that this year, as much as ever, it is crucial for everyone to process all the different options for voting. Be sure to inform yourself and decide which way you're comfortable with. To kind of talk about, as Dr. Allen mentioned, uh, some of the different procedures and the other processes uh, involved in voting, I now have the privilege of introducing attorney Molly Zerfoss, who is a staff attorney at the Office of Chief Legal Counsel in the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, which is the Pennsylvania court that will, that will initially handle any legal matters involving the election. Attorney Zerfoss's specialty is in election law, so I know I'm very excited to have her address some election questions. Molly, welcome, and uh, both Victoria and Curtis have expressed their excitement about their first time voting in a presidential election. Professor Paulson and Professor Allen have talked about how and why people vote but let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts and the who. Victoria and Curtis were hoping you could answer some of their questions about these topics, but before we get to that, maybe, do you, do you have a voting memory you would like to share? That's a great question, Phil. Um, before I answer, I'd like to start off by saying thank you to the PBA and to the Law Related Education Committee for setting up this incredibly important program and for inviting me to be a panelist. Um, I'd also like to thank President Judge Levitt of Commonwealth Court for recommending me for the program. I'm very happy to be here alongside all of the other esteemed panelists to talk about first time voting. Um, regarding your question, I can't pinpoint a specific voting memory per se, but I do remember generally being excited to vote when I finally turned 18. Um, I had always been interested in politics and government since I was a young kid. Um, and I always knew how important it was uh, that I could have a say in selecting the people who run our local, state, and federal government. Um, I think younger people tend to overlook the fact that they are a very powerful political force in their own right, and that they too can have a say in who makes our laws and decides other issues that are important to all of us. I couldn't agree more about the youth's impact on politics today. And 
especially on election day. And that makes it all the more important that they're able to make their voices heard. So let's talk some basics. You heard Curtis ask about the where and how to vote during the pandemic. Can you tell our audience how they can register vote, to vote? Sure. If you've been a US citizen for at least one month before the election, you're a resident of Pennsylvania and the election district in which you would like to register and ultimately vote for at least 30 days before the election, and you're at least 18 years old, there are four ways you can register to vote. You can go online to the Department of State's website, which is www.votespa.com. Once you click on the link there to register, it'll redirect you to a different website. Um, that's www.pavoterservices.pa.gov. You can also sign up by mail um, in person at your county voter registration office or at PennDOT and some other government agencies allow you to sign up there as well. That's great information. And we can't emphasize enough, go to votespa.com for all the information you need, to, you need to register to vote. Now, what about actually voting? Can we vote in person or by mail? This is a really good and important question for the upcoming general election that you ask. You can vote either in person or by mail, but you can't do both. So if you choose to vote by mail, then you cannot go to your polling place on election day to vote. Similarly, if you choose to vote in person on election day, then you cannot vote by mail or absentee ballot. When you register to vote, you'll be given the option to choose whether or not you want to vote by mail. As you will hear Secretary Bookbar say later in her video, you can register to vote and apply for a mail-in ballot on the Department of State's website, www.votespa.com. If you do choose to vote by mail, be sure to follow the instructions that are on your mail-in ballot. That way you can totally be sure that your vote will be counted. I think that's always a good, uh, that's always good advice to follow, to be sure to follow all instructions as we lawyers know. Uh, speaking of mail-in and absentee ballots, can you please explain the difference between the two? I think especially the college students out there will want to know the difference between the two and which option to choose, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, voters in Pennsylvania now have two options in terms of mail-in voting. Um, any qualified elector, which means you're registered to vote, um, you may apply for a mail-in ballot and you don't have to have a reason for requesting it. As Dr. Allen mentioned, voting by mail is pretty new in PA this year. And as I mentioned earlier, there's very specific rules that you have to follow when you're voting by mail. So be sure to follow those if you do choose to vote by mail. If on the other hand, you're gonna be out of the municipality on election day or you have a disability or illness that prevents you from going to your polling place, you can sign up for an absentee ballot and obviously you have to have a reason, a specific reason, for example, that you're at college for getting one of those. Um, you can apply for those on votespa.com as well. Okay, but if Victoria or Curtis choose to vote in person, how do they find their polling location? This is yet another great question, Phil. Um, if you're already a registered voter, you can find the address of your polling place on your voter registration card that was sent to you by your county board of elections. Um, if you don't have your card handy, you can also go online to the Department of State's website, again, www.votespa.com. Um, you need to know your county, city, street name, your house number, and your zip code, and you can find your polling place on there, or you can call your county elections office and ask somebody there. That's so much good and important information. And I can't stress enough, again, the website, which is officially maintained by the Pennsylvania Department of State, is www.votespa.com. Uh, Molly, one more thing about voting in person. Will Victoria and Curtis need an ID? And if so, what type? This is especially important for first time voters. If you're going to vote in person at a polling place for the very first time, you have to show your proof of ID identification. So if you voted in the 2020 primary, you do not need to show your ID at the polling place. But if November will be your first time ever voting in person at a polling place, you will need to show your ID. Um, acceptable forms of ID include a driver's license, a Pennsylvania driver's license, 
or a PennDOT ID card, an ID issued by a Commonwealth agency or by the US government, um, a passport, an armed forces ID, a student ID, or even an employee ID. Um, if you don't have a photo ID, you can also use a non-photo ID, such as a current paycheck or a government issued non-photo ID, if you would have one of those. Um, I'm told that most of you voting, um, you'll be voting for the first time this election. So if you decide to vote in person, do not forget to bring your acceptable form of ID with you. Otherwise, you may not be able to vote. That's great advice, Molly. And I think the last thing anyone wants when they're voting is to be distracted or confused so that they can focus on the offices and the candidates. Uh, speaking of which then, our final question, Victoria and Curtis would also like to know where they can find objective information about the elected offices and the candidates running for them. I'm so glad they asked this question because obviously now it's easier than ever to be an educated voter. You can go online to various websites and search for information on candidates, or you can visit the candidates' own websites. Um, some of the websites include Votes PA. You might be able to get some information there on who the candidates are. Um, I like the uselections.com website. You can search PA, and then every time you click on a candidate, it'll take you to that candidate's website. So you can find information on there. And there's also ballotpedia.org. You can find information there about the candidates. Um, I know a lot of local news websites have voter guides. Um, you can also ask your parents or guardians. And Molly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but with all the great resources you've listed, let's give that a little context. You mentioned how these resources offer information on the candidates. How do voters like Victoria and Curtis know what the candidates are running for? They're not just voting for the US president, is that right? That's correct, Phil. There's many other important offices with candidates that are gonna be on the ballot in November. These decision makers will often impact your daily life even more directly than the US president. There's a number of helpful resources to give you more information, many of which we've listed on the Pennsylvania Bar Association website, um, which is PBA, or pabar.org, sorry. Um, but one particularly detailed site that will provide you a lot of information based on your specific address is www.vote411.org slash ballot. Um, since all of the viewers represent many different local districts, we should touch on the state, state level offices that are on the November ballot. Your vote is especially important for those local matters as their decisions, once they're in office, will affect your lives more directly, for sure, than the president. Um, let's go over them briefly. There's the Auditor General, the Attorney General, the State Treasurer, there's PA state senators and state representatives. And the other really cool thing about that website, vote411.org, is that after you invest a few minutes learning more about the candidates and make your decisions on who will best represent you, you can get a printout or an email sent to you um, or to your phone to take with you to your polling place to help you remember who you wanna vote for. After all, it can get confusing with all the information out there and all the different choices we have. I definitely recommend that all first time voters do their own research on the candidates, if possible, and vote for the candidates who support what you believe. Don't worry about what others are doing. And remember, your voice is your vote. Um, it's your individual voice, not anyone else's. Thank you so much for answering all of these questions, Molly. I think it's fair to say that all of these resources and information will be invaluable to all voters, not just first timers. It was my pleasure, Phil. Thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the panelist portion of this webinar. And I can't thank Professor Paulson, Professor Allen and Attorney Zerfoss enough. I know I've certainly learned a lot and I've been voting ever since I turned 18 last year. I'm kidding, I obviously voted a lot more often than a year and I'm way older than 19, but uh, I did learn an awful lot thanks to our esteemed panel. So we do have some questions if we have time while we're waiting. Okay, 
So I, I know I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. We do have some questions. Um, let me see. So one of the questions that came in was, um, I guess, you know, in the beginning of the webinar, I said my mom took a picture with a disposable camera. Um, someone would like to know, can I take a selfie at the ballot? So can I take a selfie in the ballot? I'm not sure which one of our speakers would like to address this. Molly, I see your face lighting up if you want to start <laughs> sure um my understanding is that in pennsylvania yes you can take a ballot selfie but you need to be sure not to photograph any other voter or their vote um, and you must post it outside of your polling place um, there's really no specific law on it per se but i believe county boards of elections have made up rules for it but i'm not sure of the specifics but um, just wait until after you're done voting to post it. Okay, I don't know if any of our other panelists wanted to add anything, um, but you know, better to be safe than sorry. If you want to take that selfie in the ballot, again, make sure that you're not taking a picture of anyone else around you and do not post when you're inside the voting booth. So let's see, we have another question and this has been very popular. What should I wear when I go to vote? And can I wear a shirt in support of my favorite candidate or party? I can take that. Sure. Um, well, you can wear pretty much anything you want. I, I don't think there's any specific garb that's thought of as appropriate. And yes, you can wear uh, uh, a partisan partisan clothes or buttons and that's uh that's been a contentious question in the past uh and there were divided court rulings about it but a couple of years ago the u.s supreme court uh held that it's our first amendment right even in the polls to wear you know clothing or or badges that express uh partisan views now let me just say that that I'm not necessarily encouraging you doing that just because something is legal doesn't necessarily make it, I don't know, prudent, <laughs> right? Because I'm here to tell you that there are going to be election workers who aren't going to know about that ruling and who are going to cause a fuss about it. And there are going to be other voters who might cause a fuss about it. So if it, feels that important to you, I guess go for it. But personally, I would advise not doing it, but not because it isn't your legal right to do it. It is. It is absolutely. And so if you are wearing something and somebody challenges you, again, you have to make a decision, you know, personally, rather than get into a giant fight about it that, that slows everything down, I might take the button off. But Whatever you do, don't let somebody take away your vote for that reason. You do have a right to vote. Uh, and don't let somebody tell you you have to go home and change and come back and, and wait. No, right? You can vote wearing whatever the heck you're wearing. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Um, I don't know if any of our other panelists have anything to add. Um, and I, I do want to clarify also that, you know, this, you know, everything we're talking about today really has to deal with Pennsylvania, you know, other states like California or New Jersey may have different laws, but you know, in Pennsylvania, that is your right, as Dr. Allen said, but you may want to think very carefully <laughs> before you do that. Actually, um, that one's your right anywhere in the country. Okay. Because it's a U.S. constitutional ruling. Okay, great. Um, all right. And I see we have another question, which was, where will we, where will we, we be able to access this recording afterwards. And a recording of this session, including a full recording of our message from the secretary will be posted on our website at pabar.org. So it looks like we don't have any other questions. So if no one else has anything to add, I just wanna thank our esteemed panelists today for taking the time to be with us and to share their expertise and to comment on the election. Um, you know, thank you everyone for tuning in. And remember that October 19th 
is voter registration deadlines. You have 18 days left if you're not already registered to vote. So register now, you know, make a plan to vote, whether that's in person or by mail, whatever feels comfortable for you. Make your plan um, and then step it up. Invite your family or your friends to make a plan, you know, help them out. And remember that your vote is your voice and you wanna make sure that you're heard this election. So again, thank you. And don't forget to check out all of the great resources that we mentioned today in this webinar on our website at www.pabar.org. Thank you all so much. Take care.